I, 29F, have been married to my husband for eight years. About two months ago, I had my third miscarriage, 31 weeks. I won't be talking about it because it makes me feel so depressed, but you'll need to remember this. About four months ago, my sister-in-law, 20, came crying at our doorstep telling us she's pregnant and her boyfriend didn't want anything to do with the pregnancy and had nowhere to go. My husband and I openly took her in, welcomed her into our home with open arms. For the first few weeks, it was really hard for her, understandably. I sat with her for hours, holding her when she cried, binging our favorite TV shows, eating so much ice cream we quite literally fell into a coma. It was really bonding for us, so I thought, here's where it starts going downhill. I take pride in my neat, clean home. My sister-in-law, on the other hand, did not. She would leave her clothes all around the house, leave her dirty dishes wherever, even went as far and leaving her S3X toys on our living room table. I tried to talk to her directly before I talked to my husband. She immediately started crying and told me she'd try to be cleaner. I hugged her, told her it was okay, but this is a clear boundary for me. She told me it wouldn't happen again, but it only got worse. She told me I was expected to do her laundry, dishes, and clean her room daily because she's the pregnant one. Well, I do understand how hard it is being pregnant. I just couldn't allow feeling like a maid in my own home, disclaimer. I bought this house, not my husband. It was all me, not to mention my recent loss of my child. So I told my husband, but what he told me shocked me. His exact words were, Honey, she's going through a lot right now. We really should be helping her out. Plus, it might make you feel better to take care of someone who's pregnant. I was pissed to say the least. Make me feel better. She's going through a lot. We need to help her. Letting her stay with us wasn't enough. While I don't want to invalidate her pain, my husband and I were also going through our own problems. Anyways, we moved on. I did my best to maintain work and the household chores. My husband works 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., so he isn't around to help much. I work full-time from home, so it's been super stressful. When I even try to ask for help for my sister-in-law, she always makes an excuse. Even if she's just watching TV. The one thing that pushed me over the edge was I went out to buy my one food that I have actually enjoyed eating after my miscarriage. I wrote my name on it and directly asked my sister-in-law to not eat it. Well, I went to go to my fridge to get it, and you'll never guess. She freaking ate it. Now you may think it's just food. I buy all the groceries, basically pay all the bills. I don't mind people having some of my food, but the one thing I ask to not be touched gets touched. I told my husband and of course he rubbed it into my face that she's pregnant. I need to be less selfish, and life is about sacrifices. I was so upset I told him I felt like him, and her were the horrible roommates people talk about on Reddit. He didn't take that well lol. Which leads us to my title. My sister-in-law planned a random baby shower party thing at my house. I personally didn't know if I could even be home when this was happening. I felt so hurt that she wouldn't talk to me knowing everything that has happened and that she would just invite random strangers into another person's home before asking. My husband urged me to go, told him it would permanently affect mine and her relationship. So I told him I'd go. About halfway through the party, my husband and Esail announced that they wanted to show the nursery to everyone. I was confused. Nursery? She was staying that long. What room did she turn into a nursery? They told everyone to head upstairs. That's when it hit me. They were talking about MY nursery, for MY baby I had just lost. A wave of emotions hit me when I saw everyone in my baby's nursery telling her what a good job they did setting it up. My setup for my baby, that my body failed to give me. I just lost it. I started sobbing. Then that sadness turned into pure rage. I started yelling at my sister-in-law, telling her she's the foulest human for putting me through everything she has for the last few months, making me feel like I was a maid or an object for her convenience. Through choked-up tears, I turned to my husband whose jaw was on the floor. I turned my head to see his entire family just staring at me. I lost it again. Yelling, I looked at my sister-in-law telling her, How dare she use my nursery for my baby? How dare she think she has the right? What she told me 
made me fall to my knees sobbing. It's not my fault you couldn't produce a child. Why let this go to waste? You're so selfish. My husband tried to pick me up off the floor, but I yelled again, standing to my knees, which were now shaking, I told him. Pick. A dumbfound look on his face. I yelled again. Pick me or her. He couldn't even muster up anything to say. I just looked at him, pure butyral. I pushed past the crowd of family and ran straight up here to type this out. Even if no one sees this, at least it's helped me let these emotions out. Now's the point where I ask, am I the asshole? I sat on my bed, wiping my tears and telling myself I will not take this disrespect. I walked downstairs shutting my nursery door on the way. I was greeted with everyone comforting my sister-in-law. I kindly asked everyone besides my sister-in-law and husband to respectfully get the fuck out of my house. After all the dirty looks and shaming, it was just my husband, sister-in-law, and myself. They sat their cells on the couch, not saying anything. I sat with them. The silence felt like forever. None of us had anything to say. I knew I'd have to start the conversation. I looked at my husband and said, Did you decide? He looked at me just staring. I asked again in a firm tone this time. He ended up mumbling some sort of insult, and I couldn't really make out what he said. Something with bitchy. I stood up and told them both to get out. Then they wanted to talk. Telling me this is all a misunderstanding. They're sorry, blah, blah, blah. I grabbed a backpack from my shoe closet and told them to pack their shit. My sister-in-law told me I couldn't just make her leave, and I was a horrible person. I laughed in her face and told her this is my house, and I can do whatever I wanted. My husband stood next to me and told her it was only for a little while. I turned to him and said, oh, you two get out. He got all mad and told me we were a married couple and that this isn't how marriage works. I told him, no, it is not. Marriage is where two people support each other and not treat their wife like shit. They both ended up leaving after many insults towards me. Oh, but wait, it's not over. This morning as I was getting ready for a Zoom meeting with a few other co-workers, when my husband showed up, I let him in telling him to get whatever he needed and to go because I had to work. He started apologizing and telling me he wants to make it right. I told him I just need time away from him. Then he threw in my face, well, it's not my fault you lost our children. Maybe this would have never happened. My sister was right. You are selfish. I have never ever made my husband feel like he cannot grieve with me over this. Never made him feel less than because of his pain. I turned around and slapped him in the face. I never condone violence. And I'm very upset I would ever do that to another human. But I just couldn't deal with this. He took a step back and then threw all of my makeup on the floor, which I get, but then he started breaking all of my decor in my bathroom. I yelled at him to stop and that I was sorry, but he just kept going, even going as far as punching a hole in my bathroom wall. It was like I was seeing all of his bottled up emotions. But he went too far when he tried to grab out. me. Yelling in my face, I kicked him off and told him to get the fuck out. He walked out of the bathroom, and I watched him break a few more items as he left. The second he left I had a panic attack, looking at the mess he made, to even just seeing how much he hid his pain. I called my mother and told her everything that has been happening. I don't talk to my family much due to some past trauma with them. She told me she was on her way. The second she got here, I just broke down and she held me. Then she stood up and started taking pictures of everything he broke. I asked her what she was doing, and she turned to me and said we're suing this POS. I honestly didn't even argue. I was so hurt by everything my husband did to me. My mom packed up my computer and I grabbed a few outfits. My mom and I drove to a hotel, and she insisted on staying with me. While I finished up work my mom called a locksmith and my attorney. I will be divorcing him as well. So there it is, here's the update everyone has been waiting for. I feel guilty for just giving up on my husband in eight years of our marriage, but it's time for a divorce. I can't live like this, and neither can my husband. I wish I could say we moved on, forgave each other, and I got to see my sister-in-law have her baby. But that's not reality. If anything else happens, I will let you all know. I sat there, staring at the mess in my bathroom, the shattered decor, the broken pieces of my life. My heart raced, and my mind kept replaying the last few minutes, over and over again. His words, 
Maybe this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't lost our children. Rang in my ears like a relentless echo, cutting deeper with every repetition. How had it come to this? How had the man I'd built a life with, someone who once held me with so much love, turned into someone capable of such cruelty? The air in the room felt thick, oppressive. My thoughts swirled into a storm of anger, pain, and disbelief. It wasn't just about the nursery, or even his sister anymore. It was about everything we had lost, and everything he had buried under layers of resentment. My body trembled. My hands still shaking from the slap I'd never thought I was capable of, but it wasn't regret that consumed me now. It was something darker, more powerful. My phone buzzed on the nightstand, pulling me back to the present. I grabbed it, my vision blurred by tears. It was my best friend, Emma. She'd been the only one who truly knew how broken I felt after losing the baby. I hadn't told her about today yet, hadn't had the chance. But now it was all too much. I need you, I texted, my fingers barely steady enough to type. Seconds later, her reply came on my way. I dropped the phone and stood up, my legs barely supporting me as I stepped out of the bathroom, leaving the wreckage behind. I couldn't be in that house any longer. The walls felt like they were closing in, the memory suffocating me. I had to leave. Now. I grabbed a suitcase, throwing in random clothes, my heart pounding harder with every minute I spent in that space. The image of his face, the anger in his eyes when he broke my things, haunted me. It wasn't the man I had married. Or maybe it was, and I had just been too blind to see it. I heard a knock at the door. Emma, fast as always. I opened it, and the look on her face said everything. She didn't need words to know I was broken, shattered beyond repair. I'm getting out of here, I said, my voice shaky but resolute. She nodded, no questions, just understanding. Let's go. We headed for the door, but before I could step out, my phone buzzed again. This time it was my husband. I'm coming back. We need to talk. A cold dread settled in the pit of my stomach. No, not again. Not this time. I turned off my phone, grabbed my suitcase, and walked out the door without looking back. The house behind me, the memories, the pain, they were no longer my prison. And as Emma drove us into the night, I knew one thing for sure. I would as never As the car go back. sped through the dimly lit streets, I felt a strange mixture of relief and fear. The road ahead was unknown, but at least it wasn't there in that house, in that suffocating life. Emma glanced at me from the driver's seat, her brow furrowed with concern. You're doing the right thing, she said softly, her eyes briefly meeting mine. I nodded, though doubt not at the edges of my resolve. Eight years. Could I really walk away from everything just like that? Could I leave behind the dreams we once shared, the good moments that now felt like a distant echo? But then I remembered the look on his face, cold, detached, when he threw my pain back at me like it was my fault. Emma's voice broke through my spiraling thoughts. Where do you want to go? You can stay with me for as long as you need. I hadn't even thought about where I'd go. It didn't matter. Anywhere but there. Your place is fine for now, I replied quietly, the weight of the situation pressing down on me. As we pulled up to her apartment building, the city lights flickered above us, reflecting off the rain-slick streets. It was a chilly night, and I felt a shiver crawl down my spine. Emma parked the car and got out, helping me with my suitcase. My body felt heavy, drained from the emotional chaos of the day. Inside her apartment, the warmth and quiet felt surreal. The soft glow of the lamps, the cozy blankets. It was a stark contrast to the war zone I'd just left. I collapsed onto her couch, my head in my hands, trying to make sense of everything. But there was no sense to be found. Just a mess. A marriage broken beyond repair. A loss I would never fully recover from. Emma handed me a cup of tea, sitting down beside me. You don't have to say anything. Just breathe. You've been through hell. I wanted to say something. Anything, but my throat was tight. The events of the day swirled in my mind. The nursery, the insults, the violence. How had we gotten here? How had I let it get this far? As I sipped the tea, a thought crept into my mind, one that had been lingering at the edges of my consciousness for a while now, but had never fully formed until that moment. 
What if this is just the beginning? The realization sent a wave of fear through me. The confrontation, the anger, it wasn't over. I knew my husband wouldn't just walk away quietly. He'd be back, and he wouldn't be alone. His family, his sister, they would twist this around, make me out to be the villain, the unstable wife who couldn't handle her grief. I need to file a restraining order, I said suddenly, the words slipping out before I could fully process them. Emma looked at me, surprised but understanding. Do you think he'll come after you? I shook my head unsure. I don't know, but I can't take any chances. After what he did today, I don't trust him anymore. Emma nodded, pulling out her phone. We can take care of that first thing in the morning. We'll go to the police, document everything. You're not alone in this. The thought of going to the police, of dragging this into the legal system, made my stomach turn. But what choice did I have? I couldn't pretend that everything would just blow over. My husband had crossed a line, and I couldn't ignore the danger anymore, not to myself, and not to my own future. The night dragged on, the minutes crawling by as I lay awake in the unfamiliar silence of Emma's apartment. Every creak of the floorboards, every distant sound from the street, made my heart race. My mind replayed the scene in the bathroom, his rage, his coldness. I tried to close my eyes, but every time I did, I saw the nursery, the place that was meant for my child, now tainted by betrayal. The next morning came too soon, sunlight spilling through the curtains, though I hadn't slept at all. I sat up, feeling like a ghost of myself. Emma was already up, making coffee in the kitchen. She turned to me as I shuffled into the room. You ready? she asked, her voice gentle but firm. I nodded though I didn't feel ready at all. But this was something I had to do. For my own safety, for my own peace of mind. I couldn't live in fear anymore. We drove to the police station in silence. My hands were clammy, my heart pounding as we pulled into the parking lot. Everything felt surreal, like I was watching someone else's life unfold. But this was real. It was my life, my pain, my decision to take control of my future. Inside, I filled out the necessary paperwork, explaining the events of the past few days in painstaking detail. The officer listened, nodding, asking questions here and there, but the whole process felt like a blur. When it was over, I felt no relief, only a heavy exhaustion that settled deep into my bones. As we left the station, a text came through on my phone. It was him. I'll be home tonight. We need to talk. A chill ran down my spine. Home. He still thought of it as his home. I turned to Emma, holding up my phone. He's not giving up. She frowned, her face hardening with determination. Then we fight. He doesn't get to control you anymore. And with those words, I felt something inside me shift. I wasn't going to let him take any more from me. Not my home. Not my peace. Not my future. This was just the beginning, but this time... I was ready to fight back. I stared at the message on my phone, my hands shaking. It was as if every word he wrote carried a weight that pressed down on my chest, stealing my breath. We need to talk. But I knew exactly what that meant. More manipulation, more guilt, more attempts to twist everything until I was the one feeling guilty. Emma pulled the car over and parked in front of her apartment. She turned to me, her expression serious. We can't let him back in. He'll try to control the situation, make you question yourself. You know that, right? I nodded, but my mind was already racing ahead. What would he say? What would he try to do? Would he bring his sister into this again, try to make me out to be the villain? I felt the dread settle deep in my stomach. I need to be stronger, I whispered, not really speaking to Emma but more to myself. I need to stop letting him get in my head. Emma reached over and squeezed my hand. You are strong. Don't forget that. Everything he's done, all the pain, none of it is your fault. And if he shows up, we'll call the police. You're protected now. He can't just waltz back in and act like nothing happened. I knew she was right. Legally, I had the restraining order on my side. But emotionally, that was a whole different battle. I had spent years with him, learned to trust him, rely on him, and now I was supposed to see him as a threat? Part of me didn't want to believe it, even after everything that had happened. 
We got out of the car, and I followed Emma into her apartment. The space was warm and familiar, but I felt like a stranger in my own life. Everything I thought I knew had crumbled. Now I was standing in the ruins, unsure of what to rebuild. Later that afternoon, I sat on the couch, my phone still in my hand, staring at his text message. My thumb hovered over the screen. Should I respond? Should I just ignore it and wait for him to show up? The uncertainty gnawed at me. But before I could make a decision, Emma's voice broke the silence. You need to block him, she said firmly, setting a cup of tea in front of me. It's the only way you'll get some peace. Otherwise, he's just going to keep pushing, keep trying to pull you back in. I looked at her, torn. What if he gets worse? What if blocking him just makes him angrier? Emma's eyes softened, but her voice stayed strong. Then we'll deal with it when it happens. But right now, you can't live like this, on edge, waiting for the next text, the next move. You need to take control, even if it's just a small step. I stared at the screen again, feeling the weight of that decision. I knew Emma was right. I couldn't keep letting him invade my thoughts, my life. Slowly, deliberately, I pressed the block button, cutting off the only direct line he had to me. I felt a strange rush of emotions, fear, relief, and something like power. It wasn't much, but it was something. A tiny step toward reclaiming my life. The rest of the day passed in a blur. Emma stayed by my side, keeping me distracted with TV shows and conversations that didn't really sink in. But as the evening fell, the unease started creeping back in. My mind kept wandering to the idea of him showing up, banging on the door, demanding to talk. The thought of his anger, of what he might do, made my skin crawl. Then, just as the sun began to set, there was a knock at the door. My heart jumped into my throat. I froze, my body tense as Emma stood up, her face suddenly serious. Stay here, she whispered, walking toward the door. I didn't move. My pulse raced in my ears as I strained to hear what was happening. The knocking came again, louder this time, more insistent. My mind raced. Was it him? Did he find out where I was? I grabbed my phone, ready to call the police if I had to. Emma opened the door just a crack, her body blocking the view. I couldn't see who it was, but the tone of her voice was low and firm. What do you want? she asked. A man's voice responded, but I couldn't make out the words. Emma's posture stiffened, and I knew instantly it was him. My husband. I need to talk to her, he said, his voice sharp with desperation. I just need to explain. This is all a misunderstanding. My heart raced, my hands shaking as I gripped my phone tighter. Emma was firm. She doesn't want to see you. You need to leave. You're violating the order. I don't care about the damn order, he snapped, his voice rising. I'm her husband. She needs to hear me out. The tension in the air thickened, my breath catching in my throat. I wanted to scream, to tell him to leave, but fear kept me glued to the couch. I could hear the frustration in his voice, the edge of something darker that I hadn't heard before. Emma's voice cut through the air like a blade. If you don't leave now, I'm calling the police. There was a moment of silence, a thick, suffocating pause where I held my breath, waiting. And then his voice came again, softer this time, almost pleading. Please, just let me talk to her. I could feel the tears welling up in my eyes. A part of me wanted to hear him out, to understand how everything had gone so wrong. But the larger part of me, the part that had been crushed under his words, his neglect, his betrayal, knew there was nothing left to say. Emma's voice was calm but final. Leave. Now. There was a sound of shuffling the door closing, and then silence. Emma turned to me, her face pale but composed. He's gone, she said softly. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding, my body sagging with relief. But the fear lingered, wrapping around me like a cold blanket. I knew this wasn't over, not by a long shot. As I sat there, the realization sank in deeper. My life would never be the same again. But for the first time in months, I felt like maybe, just maybe, I was ready to fight for it. And no matter what came next, I wouldn't let him take it away from me again. As the door clicked shut behind Emma, I sat there in the stillness, feeling the weight of everything sink in. He was gone for now, but I knew the storm wasn't over. The threats, the manipulation, they'd come again. 
He wasn't the type to walk away easily, and neither was his family. But something had changed. It was subtle, but I could feel it, the tiniest spark of strength building in the center of my chest. I wasn't the same woman I was even a few days ago. I had finally taken the first step to protect myself, to put my own needs first. It wasn't just about the house, or the nursery, or the marriage anymore. It was about survival, emotional survival. Emma sat down beside me, her face a mix of relief and worry. You did the right thing, she said, her voice soft but firm. And you're going to get through this. You're stronger than you think. I wanted to believe her. But in that moment, I was still scared. Scared of what would happen next. Scared of facing this new life on my own. For eight years, I had built everything around us. Our home, our future, our dreams. But now it was just me. And as terrifying as that was, it was also freeing. I didn't sleep much that night. The fear of him coming back lingered in the corners of my mind. But more than that, I kept thinking about the next steps. I was divorcing him. It wasn't even a question anymore. The damage he had done, both physically and emotionally, couldn't be undone. And there was no going back. The next morning, I called my lawyer and started the process. It was a strange, numbing feeling to hear the words out loud, divorce. But it was also a kind of closure. A way to finally let go of the life I thought I wanted. And to start building a new one. A better one. Over the next few weeks, things slowly began to shift. My husband didn't show up again, probably thanks to the restraining order, and I started to feel a small sense of safety. I spent time with Emma, focusing on the little things that made me feel like me again. I started therapy, something I had put off for far too long, and for the first time, I began to unpack the pain I had buried inside for years. The miscarriages, the grief, the guilt. It was all there, tangled up in the fabric of my marriage, in the person I had become. The divorce wasn't easy. His family tried to intervene, of course. His sister sent me messages, blaming me for breaking up the family, accusing me of abandoning him when he needed me most. But every time I saw one of those messages, I remembered her words in the nursery. It's not my fault you couldn't produce a child. That was all I needed to remind myself that leaving was the right choice. A few months passed, and the divorce was finalized. It was a quiet day, nothing like the dramatic moment I had imagined. Just a signature on a piece of paper, but it felt like a rebirth. I stood outside the courthouse, feeling the cool wind on my face, and for the first time in a long time, I felt at peace. The weight of everything that had happened was still there, but it wasn't crushing me anymore. I had survived. Emma met me for lunch after the hearing. She hugged me tight a smile on her face. How do you feel? she asked. I paused, thinking about it. Free, I said quietly, and I realized it was true. I felt free. Life didn't magically get easier after that. Healing took time, and there were still days when the memories would hit me like a wave. But now I knew I had the strength to face them. To face anything. The nursery in my old house would always be a wound. But it wasn't my failure anymore. It wasn't my prison. It was just a room, in a house that no longer belonged to me. As time passed, I found myself imagining a new future, one where I didn't define myself by what I had lost, but by what I had survived. A future where I could finally focus on my own happiness, my own dreams, without the weight of someone else's expectations dragging me down. And one day, standing in the sunlight outside my new apartment, I realized something. I had made it. Through all the pain, the betrayal, the anger, I had made it to the other side. I had reclaimed my life, and no matter what came next, I knew one thing for sure. I was stronger than I had ever believed, and I would never let anyone take that away from me again.